Hello, everyone. This is, of course, Jared Taylor from the Biology 112 teaching team here at UBC. In this video, I want to introduce you to a particular part of aerobic respiration, and that is oxidative phosphorylation. In terms of energy production inside cells, oxidative phosphorylation is the answer to the question, where? Where do all the electrons go? If you recall from the last video, a big part of metabolism involves redox reactions and the transfer of electrons. On the catabolism side of things, this focuses on the removal of electrons from glucose during cellular respiration. These electrons eventually end up within water molecules, but the path they take is not straightforward. Moreover, this path, which is just a series of reactions, allows cells to capture potential energy from these electrons. Before we talk about that, however, I should explain why the electrons are useful for energy capture in the first place. In other words, why does removing these electrons from glucose and using them to reduce oxygen to form water release energy at all? To state the answer in a somewhat oversimplified manner, electrons that are associated with less electronegative atoms have more potential energy than those associated with more electronegative atoms. In other words, Electrons attached to less electronegative atoms can spontaneously reduce more electronegative atoms. Again, this is an oversimplification, but it works for us here in Biology 112 since we are mostly just dealing with carbon and oxygen. Going back to our glucose oxidation reaction, the electrons associated with the carbon atoms in the glucose can spontaneously reduce oxygen to form water, and this releases energy. Let's dive into this a bit more. Now, let me just state up front that what I'm about to show you isn't something we will test you on in Biology 112, but understanding it will give you more insight into oxidative phosphorylation. The ability of a molecule to be either oxidized or reduced by another molecule is quantified by its reduction potential. Stating it another way, the reduction potential is a measure of how easily a molecule can be formed via reduction. Reducing carbon dioxide to form glucose has a reduction potential of negative 0.43 volts. On the other hand, water being formed by the reduction of oxygen has a reduction potential of positive 0.82 volts. By the way, I am not showing complete and balanced reactions here. Also, you don't need to know these numbers. Now, you may notice that I have placed the more negative reduction potential at the top and the more positive potential at the bottom. This is by design, and in fact you often see reduction potential tables written like this. We do this because it makes it easy to relate the change in potential energy due to electron transfer to something we all understand, gravity. As you know, an object has more potential energy the further from the ground it is, and it loses potential energy as it falls. The same principle applies here. More negative reduction potentials, that is, those higher on the table, are associated with the electrons that have more potential energy. More importantly, if electrons move down the table during a redox reaction, their potential energy decreases. In other words, energy is released as electrons fall down the table. Yet another way to say this is that electrons from molecules higher on the table can spontaneously reduce molecules lower on the table. Now, all of that information may have made your head spin, so let's talk about glucose. Glucose has plenty of reduced carbon atoms, and its reduction potential is quite negative. Electrons can be removed from glucose to reduce oxygen and form water. Since the oxygen to water reduction reaction is further down the table with a more positive reduction potential, this electron transfer releases energy. And by the way, this is the energy that cells capture from glucose during respiration. Okay, I bet you were thinking, big deal, so what? Well, this is where it gets interesting. Cells don't transfer electrons directly from glucose to oxygen. Instead, cells transfer these electrons to electron carrier molecules. The two we need to know about are NADH and FADH2, as shown here. Notice that both of these molecules have reduction potentials that are below glucose on the table. This means that electrons can be spontaneously transferred from glucose to the electron carriers. 
This type of redox reaction is one of the big functions of the first three phases of respiration, glycolysis, pyruvate processing, and the citric acid cycle, all of which we covered during Biology 112 lecture. Returning to the electron carriers, notice that they are higher on the table than oxygen and water. This means that their electrons can be spontaneously transferred to oxygen to form water, releasing energy. It is actually this release of energy that cells use to produce most of their ATP, thereby capturing the energy for later use. This happens during the final step of aerobic respiration, known as oxidative phosphorylation. Let's talk about how it works. First of all, oxidative phosphorylation always occurs at a membrane. Which membrane is used depends on the type of cell, and this is something we will talk about during lecture. This process uses a series of large proteins embedded in the membrane, and these proteins form what is known as the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain accepts electrons from the electron carriers and uses them to reduce oxygen. So let's examine the electron transport chain from the point of view of each electron carrier. The electrons from NADH pass through three of the electron transport chain proteins, complex one, three, and four. The electrons from NADH enter the chain at complex one and then proceed to move down the chain to complex four where they reduce oxygen. Please note that this reaction is not balanced as shown. The electrons spontaneously flow from complex to complex because each protein in the chain has an increasing reduction potential, that is, becoming more positive. This means that electrons are decreasing in potential energy as they move down the chain, and energy is being released. The energy that is released is used by the complexes to do something, and that something is pumping protons across the membrane. Each of these complexes can pump protons across the membrane as electrons pass through them. This in turn creates a proton electrochemical gradient. Thanks to the difference in both concentration and charge, this gradient is storing a lot of potential energy. In other words, these protons really want to get back across that membrane. But before we talk about that, let me return to the complexes. As you can see, we are missing complex two. Complex 2 is the protein involved with electrons that are transferred via FADH2. It behaves much like complex 1, except that it does not pump any protons. Electrons entering via complex 2 also move down the chain to reduce oxygen. So, by this point, the cells have used redox reactions to transfer a lot of potential energy from glucose into a proton gradient. So that begs the question, how does all of this potential energy end up as ATP? Well, that happens in the very final stage of oxidative phosphorylation. This final step uses a rather amazing protein complex known as ATP synthase. Although its structure is quite complicated, its function is rather simple. ATP synthase provides a path for the proton gradient to travel back across the membrane. Since this happens spontaneously, this proton movement releases energy. ATP synthase then harnesses this energy to combine an ADP and a phosphate into ATP. And this process happens over and over as long as protons are moving through the ATP synthase. Thus, the potential energy from glucose has now been converted into an energy source that can be used as needed by the cell. And that is a summary of oxidative phosphorylation. As always, I feel like I have talked for far too long, so let me tie this video off. During Biology 112 lecture, we will look at oxidative phosphorylation and the resulting production of ATP in more detail.